The next item in the order paper is a motion on the statement of proposed entitlements for an official opposition. The business committee has agreed to allow up to one hour thirty minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have ten minutes to propose and ten minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Clark, please read the motion. That this, that this Assembly endorses the statement of proposed entitlements for an official opposition as set out at Appendix F4 of the Fresh Start Agreement and calls on the Speaker to take forward the implementation of these provisions before the end of the current Assembly mandate. I call Junior Minister Pengeli. Junior Minister. The purpose of the motion which we have tabled for debate today is to seek the Assembly's endorsement of the Statement of Proposed Entitlements for an Official Opposition as set out at Appendix F4 of the Fresh Start Agreement. The Statement of Proposed Entitlements sets out a number of provisions for an official opposition, which, if agreed by members today, will grant you the authority to decide how each element should be taken forward including which aspects could be implemented through administrative changes or speakers' rulings, and which could require changes to standing orders. The origins of the development of the Statement of Proposed Entitlements for an Official Opposition date back to the period leading up to the Stormont House talks in 2014. At that stage, the creation of an official opposition within the Assembly was cited as one means by which the executive could be made more accountable and more responsive to the Assembly. The devolution settlement and the Northern Ireland Act, which underpins it, are based on the principle of inclusive government, whereby all those political parties with sufficient electoral strength are entitled to participate in the executive through the nomination of a minister or ministers to it. The Northern Ireland Act does not therefore make any provision for the concept of or mechanism for opposition. While it is of course open to any eligible party to forego its executive seats, as the Ulster Unionist Party has now done, at present no special status or entitlements attached to this action. The recognition of and means of support for an official opposition were therefore discussed in the Stormont House talks together with other aspects of institutional reform. The 2014 Stormont House Agreement stated that arrangements would be put in place to enable those parties which would be entitled to ministerial positions in the executive but choose not to take them up to be recognised as an official opposition and to facilitate their work. The agreement also indicated that these arrangements sorry, the, the agreement also indicated that these arrangements should include provision for cost-neutral financial and research assistance and designated speaking rights. Following the Stormont House Agreement, a subcommittee on institutional reform was established and remitted to consider what entitlements a future official opposition should receive. The subcommittee deliberated on this and reported to the party leaders implementation group. The measures which we are proposing today reflect those discussions and represent the measures on which there was the broadest degree of consensus. These are outlined within Appendix F4 of the Fresh Start Agreement and are as follows. It is proposed that the provisions to be made for an official opposition will be made available to and, Mr Speaker, be restricted to those parties which would be entitled to ministerial positions in the executive, but choose not to take them up. Sorry, I want to finish this initial speech and then you can respond to that um, through the speaker. Uh, and I'm happy to pick up those points in terms of the winding speech. I think that will be a more appropriate way to deal with that matter. Concerning the timing of when parties choose to go into opposition, such parties should elect to do so at a time they decline the offer of a ministerial position in the executive when the hunt is run at the start of the mandate to fill ministerial offices. The provisions to be made for an official opposition will be put in place by way of an administrative or other means not requiring primary legislation. This will be a matter for you, Mr Speaker, and the Assembly to progress. 
parties noted that giving the provisions a legislative footing would require Westminster legislation. It was agreed that a major element of the provision to be made for an official opposition should take the form of enhanced speaking rights during plenary business in the Assembly. This is in common with the provision typically made for official oppositions in jurisdictions elsewhere and would apply to the range of business undertaken in the Chamber. During question time, the official opposition will be permitted to ask the first supplementary question after the tabling member for the first three listed oral questions to each minister. During topical questions, they will be allocated the first topical question to the minister outside of the usual ballot for such questions. During questions for urgent oral answer, the official opposition will be permitted to ask the first supplementary question following the member who tabled the question. In relation to executive business in the chamber concerning budget and programme for government debates, the official opposition will be permitted to be the first contributor following the minister in such debates. When executive legislation is being taken through the House, bill debates, subordinate legislative le legislation motions and legislative consent motions, the official opposition will be the first contributor in such debates, following the relevant statutory committee chairperson, if appropriate. It will, uh, similarly, be the case that the official opposition will be able to table the first question to ministers following ministerial statements and be the first contributor after the tabling member to a matter of the day. It was agreed that it would be for the Speaker, in consultation with the Business Committee, to determine the frequency with which opposition debates are to be scheduled. Concerning the provisions to be made in terms of enhanced speaking rights in the Chamber, it was agreed that were the official opposition to comprise more than one party, the apportionment of speaking rights amongst parties will be determined by such parties on the basis of party strength. It would be envisaged that the process to do so might mirror that used for the allocation of private members' businesses by the Business Committee. While it is acknowledged that, once an official opposition comes into operation, custom and practice is likely to lead to titles being confirmed upon members of parties which form part of the official opposition, there was broad agreement that no formal provision for titles should be made. A further element of the provision to be made relates to cost, neutral, financial and research assistance for opposition parties. It was agreed that this should be provided either through the financial assistance to political party scheme or ring fencing of assembly research facilities. As might be expected in discussions involving the five parties, which at that point were represented on the executive, there were other proposals which did not receive general support and they were not therefore included in the statement of proposed entitlements. The purpose of the motion which we are debating today is to seek the Assembly's endorsement of these measures and to remit the Speaker to commission the necessary work to ensure that they are in place for the start of the new Assembly mandate in May this year. We obviously cannot predict what parties are indeed if any parties may choose to forego their entitlement to a seat in the executive. However, if we accept the principle that an official opposition should be recognised, then it is important that its status is made meaningful and effective through the implementation of the provisions outlined within the Statement of Proposed Entitlements for an official opposition which is before us for debate today. We also do not expect that these measures will be definitive, but they do provide for a broad range of provisions to be made immediately available for the official opposition which future assemblies will be able to review and, if they wish, enhance. We also do not believe that their introduction will compromise any future consideration of a statutory underpinning for an official opposition, should it be determined that this is required. Mr Speaker, it is for these reasons that we seek the Assembly's endorsement of the statement of proposed entitlements for an official opposition and for the implementation of these provisions to be taken forward by you before the end of the current mandate. Thank you. And I now call the chairperson of the committee for the office of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, Mr Mike Nesbitt. Ah, Mr Speaker, 
Uh, you surprise me. Um, I welcome the statement uh, from the Minister. Uh, I think the Committee has, uh, is certainly aware uh, of these proposals, uh, but I stand to be corrected. I don't believe the Committee has taken a position on these proposals for an official opposition. So with your permission, uh, I will take off the hat of the Committee Chair and speak uh, as an individual. Uh, as the Minister says, the Ulster Unionist Party has already voluntarily withdrawn from the current uh, Northern Ireland uh, executive. Uh, we do promote the introduction of an official opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we see that as the next mature step towards a normal democracy uh, here in Northern Ireland. So it's not about undermining anything. Uh, it is about improving uh, and acknowledging, in fact, that these institutions uh, are here to stay. Uh, and for the avoidance of doubt, let me say, in calling for an opposition, this is not about uh, some sort of play for a return to majority rule. When we talk about normal democracy, we understand that for the foreseeable future, uh, the executive must be led on a cross-community basis. Uh, and therefore, the largest parties of the two main traditions uh, will form the core of the government, or at least have first refusal uh, in that regard. I'm extremely keen uh, to put on record once again, the Ulster Unionist Party felt that the creation of an official opposition had to be cost neutral uh, compared to what we are currently spending on running our government. There could be no increase. Therefore, we were not looking uh, for any salaries, uh, for any leaders uh, within an official opposition, nor were we looking for anything other than perhaps some ring-fenced access to assembly research. And again, uh, the junior ministers made clear that that facility is envisaged uh, within the so-called Fresh Start Agreement. Uh, as she said, there were, there were arguments that we made but lost. We would very much have liked to have seen the official opposition having a first refusal at a number of committee chairs. That's not going to happen. Uh, and indeed, more broadly, we would have preferred if the legislation to create, or the mechanism to create an official opposition had been primary legislation uh, coming out of Westminster. Uh, call us cynical, but maybe we believe that uh, what you can give in a debate like this uh, one day, you can take away the next. But that's the rough and tumble of politics. We made our case. Uh, we lost some of the argument, but we won the big argument, which is that we should have an official opposition. And I very much welcome the junior minister making clear that after the election, when we go into the negotiations on the program for government, it will be at the point that the hunt is run, at the point the hunt is run, that a party will have to make the call as to whether it takes its entitlement to be at the executive table or withdraws to form part or the whole uh, of an official opposition. And at that point, Mr. Speaker, I will draw my remarks to a close. And uh, let me congratulate you on that quick recovery, although I have to say the podium misled me. I thought you were sitting there as a result of being the chairperson and had a podium on that basis, but uh, very well done indeed. Uh, Mr. Gordon Lyons. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, it's good to take part uh, in this debate today, and I very much support the motion um, that is before uh, the House. I think that we have made considerable progress in recent um, weeks in terms of the implementation uh, of the Fresh Start Agreement and the important reforms that are found uh, within that. We have already discussed reducing the number of MLAs reforming and cutting the number uh, of government departments. And I think that this is another uh, important part of the reform uh, process that we are starting down uh, this road of having an official opposition. Uh, obviously, um, what has been set out uh, today um, is, uh, although it is not legislative change, it, it, I suppose in effect, Mr. Speaker, is giving you, um, placing some responsibility on, on your shoulders uh, in order that we make sure that these changes are, are implemented through our standing orders or uh, wherever else those changes would need to be made. But what we have um, to begin with, and I, and I say that we, we are beginning here, we're not saying that this is the end uh, of the journey, we're not saying that we've got this all right, but we're saying we start here and it will be up to those within the next mandate to decide where they want to go after that, but um, we, have, we will now have arrangements in place uh, at the start of the new mandate, and I think that that is very important. Uh, it comes down, uh, opposition really comes down to, to two issues. Uh, it's time and money, 
and we see that the, the time is going to be given here uh, to those that would wish to um, be part of the official open, uh, the, the official opposition. Um, at question time, I think it's very significant that um, the first supplementary question after the tabling member for the first three listed questions will um, go during question time to someone who is not uh, a member of any of the parties that are uh, in government. The first contributor to debates following the, the budget and the uh, programme for government uh, will also um, be someone from the opposition parties and in terms of ministerial statements, matters of the day and also an entitlement to opposition debate. So I think that certainly uh, there is the time here for those who are not in government to ensure that their voices are heard uh, and to ensure that they have that ability in terms of time to scrutinise the work uh, of the executive. But then we also have uh, money as, as well as time we have money and there is uh, financial assistance uh, available to those who wish to form um, the opposition and I agree very much with Mr Nesbitt that um, this is a good thing that this is done on a cost neutral basis because we um, haven't cut the number of MLAs and we haven't cut the number of government departments to save money that way uh, in order that we spend more uh, in terms of funding uh, an official opposition. And so I think that's a very positive start uh, that we have here in front of us. It's obviously something that we can return to uh, at a later stage. Um, but I very much welcome the progress uh, that has been made and will be supporting the motion this evening. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I call Mr Alec Mas Good, uh, Corla, um, I also rise on behalf of Sinn Féin to uh, support the motion and to uh, support the endorsement of the provisions of an entitlement and uh, obviously that hopefully if the assembly endorses that the, the motion today this evening then mr speaker then you will have the fairly onerous task of working with the business committee and making your own uh, rulings as well within the, the entitlement of the speaker and i think uh, as far as our party would be concerned we're quite happy to uh, support the provision and enablement of uh, such an opposition, although I would have to say, I think, certainly speaking for myself and many others, I would much prefer that all of those who have an electoral mandate we are around the table working together, sharing the burden of trying to tackle all of the many outstanding difficulties that we as a society have yet to uh, resolve. And I don't think it's fair that parties would go and get a mandate and then stand away from shouldering that responsibility, but that would be their choice, and that's fair enough. And the, the provisions, uh, if endorsed here today, um, enabling yourself, Mr. Speaker, to take us forward, will provide for that. Um, as I've said, I do think that um, the provisions uh, contained here would be generous in the circumstances that we live in. There certainly will be adequate for those who want to uh, put themselves into opposition. As I said, uh, our party are more, more than happy to support this. It has already been said that this does not mean that this has to be either definitive. It does not mean at all that in the future there would not be some further legislative underpinning for such provisions if they are required and people want to make those arguments in due course. And I certainly and our party will be keen, as always, to listen to those arguments and move forward on the basis of that. But for now, and particularly for May, so right at the beginning of the next mandate, there will be a provision for opposition. I just hope that uh, some of those people who are seeking uh, the rights for to be in opposition uh, don't ever regret you know, seek getting what they asked for. Gary Mina Margot. Thank you. And come, Sir Alec. At Mr. Uh, uh, Speaker, and could I apologise that I missed the uh, opening remarks of the... Um, of the junior minister in terms of the, uh, the, uh, her statement. Um, and in that regard, uh, uh, in order to create certainty and avoid doubt, could I ask a question, uh, a series of questions, and would ask for definitive responses? Uh, it was touched upon by Mr. Nesbitt, and therefore it may well already be covered. So at page 55 of Fresh Start, uh, which uh, is the uh, statement of proposed entitlements for an official opposition. Um, the paragraph one of uh, that statement says, and I quote, those parties which would be entitled to ministerial positions in the executive but choose not to take them up, um, to be, which would be entitled to ministerial positions in the executive but choose not to take them up, 
to be recognised as an official opposition. Those parties which choose to go into opposition should elect to do so at the time they decline the offer of a ministerial position in the executive when the hunt is run. And I think Mr Nesbitt referred to that. Then I refer to paragraph 61 of Fresh Start. And I'd ask the junior minister to confirm that the only and proper interpretation of paragraph uh, 1 of section F about entitlements and paragraph, six, paragraph 61 is the one that Mr Nesbitt referred to because it says in paragraph 61 of uh, Fresh Start, quote, after the assembly meets following an election and before the FM, DFM are in selected and the, the hunt process runs, representatives of the parties who are entitled to take up places in the executive and who confirm their intention to do so will meet to resolve the draft programme for government. So my question to the uh, junior minister is this. Is the meaning of that that before the programme for government is concluded, parties have to declare their intention to enter into government? Or is it the case, which seems to be the more proper uh, position, that it is only at the time when De Hunt is run that parties may choose to go into opposition or go into government? And there is a difference between the two, and there may be a tension between the two, in that one says you decide when the hunt is about to run, and the other essentially decides when uh, you are about to resolve the draft programme for government and before the hunt is run. And I would ask clarification from the junior minister as to what it is, uh, because. Uh, uh, I think there is a proper way to handle this matter in the event that any party wants to go into opposition, and I think there is less than proper way, and the less than proper way is to declare what you are doing before the programme for government is finally resolved. My second question to the junior minister is then uh, what follows in paragraph 61, quote, changes to Westminster legislation as soon as time permits could extend the time available from seven days to 14 days. This is in respect to the programme for government. Could I ask the junior minister, have there been any conversations with uh, London in relation to any Westminster legislation? Um, not necessarily in respect of seven to 14 days, but in respect of the previous point I made, namely about confirming your intention to do so namely enter into government in advance of a draft programme from the government being resolved. Have there been any conversations with London? If so, what are they? Is there any legislation coming? Although I presume the answer to all of that is negative, uh, uh, but uh, subject to the Minister's um, uh, comments, I, I would ask answers to that. The SDLP have been arguing since 2011, uh, 2012 in a submission that uh, was presented to then Secretary of State in respect of his consultation around a miscellaneous provisions bill for Northern Ireland. We've been arguing for legislation uh, uh, to put in place an opposition with entitlements in this assembly. And in as much as uh, this statement moves in that direction, uh, that is the right direction to move. Of course, we've always argued that, consistent with uh, uh, entitlements under the Hunt and Democratic Mandate. And, and that it would be the intention of us and every party, I presume, to touch upon the point that made by Mr Maskey, that you seek a democratic mandate to enter into negotiations of programme government, on the far side of which you enter into government. That clearly is the ambition of any and all parties, and that is the ambition of the SDLP. But subject to those uh, two questions and the potential tension between those two paragraphs, uh, the STLP are prepared to see the statement move forward. Mr. Stuart Dixon. 
you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I will be brief. Um, I'm actually speaking on behalf of my colleague, uh, Mr. Little, who is unwell this evening. But just to place on record that the Alliance Party does support uh, the, the, the establishment of an opposition. However, we are not in a position to endorse um, the uh, proposal this evening, not least of all because of some of the issues that others have raised, and not least of all that of where the po a party would qualify for executive position but could choose to form uh, part of an opposition. Uh, however, I do wish to, to uh, leave the House clearly um, understanding that the Alliance Party is in support of, of those moves towards an opposition. Thank you. I call Mr Jim Allister. I note it's almost three months since the fresh start had this revelation that would have uh, an opposition and indeed the motion only uh, came to fruition when Mr McAllister's bill was about to hit the floor of the House. Uh, so I think I can draw some conclusions from that. Uh, one can also draw conclusions as to the appetite of, of the uh, supporters, the two parties who who in the main support Fresh Start, the appetite they have for opposition, that they've happily conducted business for years without opposition. Uh, I'm glad that at least kicking and screaming they're being dragged somewhat in that direction. Uh, but of course they're trying to, be, to take a de, de, min, a de, de minimis approach because they're trying to make it as hard as possible to be in opposition. And so they, they want to set the threshold at a, a turning down being eligible for and then turning down a position in government in the hope that all other parties will be imbued with the same greed that they have for office uh, and will not turn down government office, uh, that the lure for everyone else will be as strong, the lure of the limo will be as strong as it obviously is for the two proponent parties. Uh, and thus they set the threshold as high as they could. Uh, uh, and that effectively means given the drop in the number of departments, that it's quite possible that it could take 11 or 12 seats to qualify for an executive place uh, after May, which means there could be as many as 30, maybe a third of this House, not eligible for inclusion in the executive, and not eligible, therefore, to be in opposition, because the threshold has been set so artificially high in order to discourage the practice of opposition. So the first challenge uh, to the department is if they genuinely are so keen as they now belatedly would like to have us think to actually see an opposition, why are they making it as difficult as possible to establish an opposition by putting the bar as high as they can and contemplating the situation where you might have 30 or more members in this House not eligible for participation in the executive, but equally not eligible for participation in the executive. Yes, I'll give way. Thank Mr. Alistair for giving way. Mr. Alistair makes the point that he thinks the bar has been set too high, but what we have here is an extensive list uh, of uh, opportunities for members to speak within this chamber uh, if you're in the official opposition. Now, if you're saying there's only going to be maybe, you say there could be up to 30, but what if there's only three or four or five members uh, in uh, the opposition? That would mean they'd be the first to speak on budget debates, on programme for government debates, the first three questions after question time. Surely that would be unfair um, to all the me other members in this House for such a small number of people to have such a huge influence. What fresh start? I don't know what fresh start document Mr. Vance has been reading, certainly not the one that's published on the OFM DFM website, because it only anticipates those powers for an opposition if they are parties that have turned down a place in government. Then, so the, the suggestion that three or four people could exercise these functions in the fresh start document is really nonsense. I'm making the point you could have as many as 30 members of this House not eligible for government, not eligible for opposition, uh, uh, and uh, OFM, DFM merrily, happily carry on. But it brings me the, to the point, and it's the point that the junior minister was surprisingly timid about in that she wouldn't even give way. Uh, and the question is this. The question for the junior minister is this. When her party last Tuesday were making an offer in, in John McAllister's bill, on the debate to see a threshold of 8% as the qualification for being an opposition party. Was her party only playing games with Mr. McAllister? 
Because are they wedded to what the fresh start says? Or is half of the fresh start proponent parties in the camp of saying, we're quite happy to reduce it to 8%? I think this House is entitled to know. Is the DUP playing games with Mr McAllister's bill? Or are they serious about saying the threshold could be 8%? Or are they wedded to what they're putting before the House tonight? namely the Fresh Start document. So I think that self-inflicted confusion needs to be clarified and clarified very thoroughly by the junior minister. And I hope she won't duck and dive and dodge that question. Simple question. Is her party playing games with Mr McAllister or are they serious about accepting 8% as the threshold? And if so, where does that leave the Fresh Start document? And perhaps we could get an answer to that. As to it being cost neutral, I've got an idea for Minister Pengelly. Uh, we could fund this by culling a lot of the special advisors' posts in OFM, DFM, it, same as the Welsh Government. Well, if we want to make this cost neutral, it would not be a good starting place by reducing uh, the number of posts there uh, and, uh, and putting it to more uh, good use than presently. It is put. So perhaps, and I hope she won't dodge those issues, the junior minister, though she is not willing to take interventions, will try to answer the questions. Thank you. And I call junior minister Pengelly to conclude and wind on the debate. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank members for their contribution to this important debate on the provisions to be made to give recognition to an official opposition and to facilitate the work undertaken by parties entitled to ministerial positions in the Assembly, but who choose not to take them up. I would like to respond to some of the issues raised by members during the course of this debate. I welcome the broad support of the Leader of the Ulster Unionist Party on this motion. It does not include, as I mentioned, everything that was asked for, and I know that that will be a source of frustration for some. But it does constitute, in my view, a strong basis for the way forward. And uh, as we enter into the uh, next term, I do think it also gives an opportunity for further discussion and consideration on potentially how to improve and enhance and to build on this progress of establishing an official opposition. In relation to my colleague, uh, Mr Gordon Lyons, again, I welcome the support for this key move towards building a more normal way of working. And I believe that that is a way of working that everyone in Northern Ireland wants to see. I think this is not the final step, but it is an important step towards that normality. I welcome the support of uh, Mr Alex Maskey in relation to the bill. Uh, I uh, reference his comments that he would uh, seek that all parties would want to be included and involved and that they should be included and involved. But I also welcome his remarks that uh, this should be a choice uh, for some of the parties as opposed to being uh, forced to be included and involved. And we've seen some of the outworkings of that uncomfortable relationship in the past. In relation to the specific questions from Mr Alex Atwood, uh, we acknowledge that uh, there is a tension between these issues, and I think it is difficult uh, at all points to get a satisfactory uh, conclusion which suits all purposes. We wanted to uh, ensure that parties would have the opportunity uh, to consider what the programme for government is, uh, what has been negotiated and agreed, uh, and to make a decision in terms of whether or not they wanted to be in government to operate that programme for government. However, it may well be the case that there are political parties who have no intention of uh, being in the government of Northern Ireland and operating that programme for government. And I think um, instinctively um, that there is a perversity in a party with no intention of being in government negotiating a programme for, for government uh, to be operated by the executive. So I think there is a tension um, within those. We would welcome parties' views on those issues, um, but we certainly wouldn't want to close off the opportunity for those who want to give it the best opportunity, um, but perhaps feel that they, they could not sign up to what eventually comes out of that uh, process of negotiation. Um, yeah. I thank the Minister uh, for giving way. 
to a question on a point. I mean, the question is, how, how would you know that a party has no intention of actually taking their seat or seats? And secondly, would it be the case that if a party did at that point of running to haunt withdraw, would it be a case that maybe the remaining parties decided that they wish to redraw the programme for government and take out some compromises that have made, may have been put in specifically to please the party that has now withdrawn? I agree with the member that it would be difficult to prejudge these issues, but it may, it may also be the case that some parties will go into the election process, they simply don't know this, will go into the election process um, being very upfront that they are intending to go into um, opposition. If that is the case, I suppose that is the best way to assess that. Um, in relation to the negotiation, um, I, I think it would be a very strange situation where um, you've got a, an agreement which has been uh, negotiated, it's a compromise, the parties effectively sign up to that and then subsequent to that you have a political party who decides that despite that and despite having their input and seeing their work within the programme for government, they tactically or strategically uh, disengage and want to go into an official opposition. So, so uh, as I outlined, there is a tension between these. We want to provide a fair and equitable approach to everybody in relation to this. And uh, as I have mentioned, we would certainly welcome the views of parties on how to uh, seek a, an effective way to uh, address that tension between those issues. Um, in relation to the point raised by um, Alex Atwood in relation to the 7 to 14 day change, I am happy to confirm for him that there have been substantial discussions with the UK government and that the Secretary of State is uh, proposing to publish a bill in relation to these implementation issues very uh, shortly. Um, yes? Uh, uh, if a bill is published soon, is there any indication when it might be tabled and when it might be passed? And is the bill to have any other proposals other than a change from seven to 14 days? In particular, going back to the point that I made re recently, any proposed change in relation to that clause about confirming their intention to enter into government? What are the clauses of this bill likely to include? Well, I can advise the member that um, the, the purpose of publishing the bill will be to have that consideration in relation to what is included, but the purpose is very much to implement the fresh start. So to look at those issues which are pertaining to the responsibility of the British government. Um, and there have been ongoing discussions through a process of implementation uh, in terms of the logistical side of that led by the head of the civil service. But I'm happy if there's specific issues to write to the member uh, in due course. In relation to the comments from uh, the member, uh, Mr. James Allister, um, with the greatest respect to Mr. Allister, um, I, I think most people in Northern Ireland would struggle to see that uh, the bar of getting one ministerial seat was considered, in your own words, particularly high. In fact, I think most people would consider it to be quite low. Uh, and I don't think it is unreasonable that that is the bar that has been negotiated and uh, agreed. In relation to the other issues which he has mentioned, I'm not sure if the, the member is familiar with the concept of compromise and agreement, but what is presented in the fresh start is a compromise and agreement. And by its very nature, we don't get everything that we want, and nor does anybody else. We come together for the good of the people of Northern Ireland to try to find a way through very difficult and challenging issues, to get agreement in order to build the better and brighter future and ensure that these institutions and that devolution and local government can exist for the people of Northern Ireland. That requires compromise and agreement. Very nice platitudes, I'm sure. But what about addressing the question, if after the election, because it will now maybe take 11 or 12 members to qualify for the executive. There are 30 plus members in this House incapable of qualifying for the executive. Does she think it's right that there should, in those circumstances, be no provision for an opposition? And would she answer the question when suggesting last week, her party suggesting last week, that they would agree in Mr McAllister's bill to reduce the threshold to 8 per cent, in other words, nine MLAs. Was she playing games, or is she wedded to the fresh start 
and it's that or nothing. Could we have answers on those two questions, please? Perhaps the member, Mr Speaker, doesn't understand the way this works. I'm standing here today as a Minister of the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and I am responding to this debate today as a junior minister in the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And I would suggest to the member that perhaps if he doesn't understand and he wants a party response into that, he should ask the party speaking as the DUP, not as junior minister responding on behalf of the department. I have made it clear that I am standing here today making it absolutely clear that we are presenting what is necessary to give rise and give effect to the Fresh Start Agreement, an agreement that was a compromise, it was an agreement between parties, and that is what we are honouring here today. The discussion that the member is so eager to get into will take place in, in the midst of another debate, which is ongoing at this time in relation to the members, uh, private members' bill, Mr. Uh, jo John Allister. So, McAllister, the, therefore, um, I would just like to, to bring the remarks to a conclusion by saying I would like to thank members once again for their contributions, positive and otherwise, to the debate and for the questions and issues they have raised. I hope I have been able to answer them to their satisfaction. A fresh start has provided a basis for addressing a range of institutional reform issues relating to this Assembly, none the least of which is the important issue before us for the debate today. But we must move now, if this matter is to be concluded by the end of the current Assembly mandate. This requires that the motion before us be passed by the House. I am therefore asking the Assembly to approve the motion today. Yet another important step towards normal politics here. I welcome that and I believe Northern Ireland will welcome that. <coughs> order members, the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary no. The ayes have it, the ayes have it. I detect only one voice in the negative. The ayes have it.